Good morning, and welcome to the Universalist Church in which love is the spirit. We're glad you're here, here in the sanctuary or anywhere in the world, especially those visiting or returning after a time away. I'm Joe Wilson, one of your representatives on the Board of Trustees and an active member of our congregation here. If you're a visitor, we hope you'll talk with our welcome team or visit our webpage, www.westhartfordu.org, to learn more about us. Our guest book or online contact page will help you get onto our electronic mailing list. We have found that our electronic communications are the best way for us to stay connected. We look forward to helping you become part of the Universalist Church. We're still dealing with the pandemic, though, though the risk of severe illness is considered low. But if you're unvaccinated or would prefer a mask, our ushers have some that we are happy to share. After worship, we'll have fellowship in Fisk Hall and through Zoom. We'd encourage everyone to come back to Fisk Hall today because the social justice ministry is having a rally around getting out the vote. And there are going to be a lot of festivities, so that'll be a lot of fun. If you need help finding your way to Fisk Hall for our fellowship hour, any member of the church will be happy to guide you. Just look for someone wearing a Universalist Church name tag, which I forgot this morning. You can find the link for Zoom in your weekly news or our Breeze calendar. And if you aren't getting the weekly news, please sign up for it on our website. And now, I invite you to take a moment and make your mobile phone silent, turn off your email, put away all those keyboards, and settle in for worship. It is a blessing to hear the shofar as we enter the high holy days. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the days of awe. If you at home have a chalice, I invite you to light yours as we light ours now. O source of peace, lead us to peace, a peace profound and true. Lead us to a healing, to a mastery of all that drives us to war within ourselves and others. 
May our deeds inscribe us in the book of life and blessing, righteousness and peace. O oh, source of peace, bless us with peace. Our opening hymn today is number 1037 in the blue hymnal. Number 1037, please rise in spirit or in body, in the sanctuary or wherever you are as we sing together. This is a little bit of an unusual hymn um, in that I will be speaking to you uh, a line and then you all as the congregation will respond with the sung part. And it should be easy for those of you at home, too, uh, because the sung part just repeats again and again. So as you hear it, you will be able to join in with all of us. And so we begin, again in love. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. We forgive ourselves and each other. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time we have struck out in anger without just cause. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin For the selfishness that sets us apart and alone, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit, we forgive ourselves and each other. For losing sight of our unity. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separateness. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. And now please join me in speaking the words of our affirmation, our covenant. It's in your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Please be seated. I am excited because I get to tell you a story today. And this story is called Build, Shore Up, and Retreat. There was once a village that sat at the edge of a riverbank on a long, slow-flowing river. There were houses right up to the edge, and everyone who lived there was able to enjoy the view of the water and the swimming of the ducks, the gentle sounds of the river, and some people especially enjoyed the time to fish and enjoy the fresh fish they had to eat. 
This village had been there for well over a hundred, maybe even two hundred years. Long enough that they had forgotten that once the village had sat quite a bit inland, not right up against the river, and that the flowing of the river had changed over time, eroding the riverbank, coming closer and closer and closer to all of the homes. They used to have to take a path and then stairs to get down to the river itself, but instead now they had steps down from their very back porches to their boats right below. And so one day, when the villagers were at their various tasks, at home or at work or outside playing, they heard a horrible squealing noise and a groan and a shudder and a whine and then a terrible crashing and splashing. And everybody stopped what they were doing and ran down to the river's edge to see what was going on just in time to see one of the porches that had been on somebody's house floating away down the river. They watched, horrified, as it turned around the bend and disappeared from view forever. And once everybody recovered, they took a minute and they began talking and then debating and then arguing about what to do until the three people who lived most closely to the river's edge spoke. I want to rebuild my porch stronger and better than before, said the owner of the house that had been torn apart and who hoped that things eventually might be just as they once were. I want to move away from the water, said the person who lived right next door, and was afraid that the river was growing stronger and faster and might do some harm to their home. I want to shore up the riverbank, said the person who lived on the other side of the house where the porch had disappeared. And they thought things might actually just be okay with a little bit of effort and a little bit of time. And the mayor of the town said, I want to help each of you do the things that you need to do. And I want everybody here to help everybody else make it happen. And so the people in town who could work with stones began building a wall inside the riverbank to strengthen it, stop it from eroding. And the people in town who knew how to work with wood helped to rebuild the porch that was lost and made it stronger so that it wouldn't break and fall off and be torn down. And then they went and helped with the other houses and their porches too. And everyone else, people who didn't have those special skills with wood or with stone or able to manage how a project was going to work, they did everything else. They helped people move things. The owner of the house who wanted to get away from the river had an entire life, a full home to move. And so everybody helped. Even the children carried single spoons or some lightweight pillows to the houses on the other side of the village. Everybody did something, the very best they could, to help everyone else in the village. And now, that village still stands right at the edge of the riverbank. And every so often, somebody clambers down into the river to make sure that the walls are still sturdy and that the porches are strong. And every so often, somebody who thought it was a great idea to live near the river and watch it decides that it's time to move. And everybody helps them by carrying pillows, and furniture, and sometimes individual spoons to a house further away. And the village, all together, always chooses to help the people who are lonely or scared, who can't do everything on their own 
because none of us can. And every time they help one another, they make their village a happier and safer and better place to live. And that is the end of that part of the story, because that village's story goes on and on and on. Let's sing our children out to their classes. It's number 413 in your gray hymnal, Go Now in Peace. Go now in peace. so many years. It is wonderful to see teachers and students going out to their classes and just to be singing that song again. Thank you. The voluntary offering, the sharing of our resources for our shared work as a religious community is a spiritual practice for us. By offering your time, talent, and treasure to this community, you help us serve the members and the friends and the wider community of our congregation. And as part of that service, we share our general offering each week with organizations that do the work in the world that brings us ever closer to creating a beloved community. I do want to mention, I'm not sure if I had mentioned this last week, you'll notice that we do have new offering plates. And we have been trying to do this for a while because our old ones, while beautiful, are quite old. They were a gift to this congregation many, many, many decades ago and have grown fragile over time. And so we still have them, we are keeping them, and they will go on display with some of our other history as we turn some more of the parlor into our history space. So I want you to know that they're not just gone, they're here, but we want to protect them and us, and so we have these new plates to use. This month, we share our offering with Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is one of the nation's leading providers of high quality, affordable health care, and it is the nation's largest provider of sex education. They serve everyone. Women, trans and non-binary people, men, people with or without insurance. I have taken advantage of their services in the past, and I suspect a number of you have as well. And if you haven't, you definitely know people who have. They provide everything from primary care to vaccinations, as well as pregnancy, sexual health, and abortion services. To give electronically, please use the QR codes on your order of service or the links that you will find on our website. Here in the sanctuary, our offering will now be gratefully received.
May these gifts so generously given sustain the work that we do together, the life of this community, and help support work in the wider world of which we are most definitely a part. Thank you. Our congregational reading this morning is number 567 in the back of the gray hymnal. Number 567. It's called To Be of Use. Please rise in body or in spirit as we speak it together. I'll read the words in Roman type, and you may respond with the words in italics. <clears throat> I want to be with people who submerge in the task who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who stand in the line and haul in their places, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles into dust. But the thing worth, worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Let's join in singing our doxology. It's in your order of service. Praise God for the After a number of weeks of not having much to share with you before our time of prayer and meditation, there's a lot that happened recently. Some joyful, some hopeful, and some sorrowful too. So first I need to let you know that longtime member Bets Bradley died recently. She and her husband were very, very longtime active members of this congregation. And I know that we have kept in contact with her through our lay ministers team uh, in, in recent years. Some of you will remember her. Some of you might have heard her name. Um, but they are an important part of this church's history. And so we grieve her loss and wish her well. Sophie E. is now in a new recovery hospital and not only able to receive cards and text messages, but is ready for some visitors, in fact. This is great news toward her recovery, and she has high hopes that uh, she will be on her way back to walking without any extra needs for help in the not-so-distant future. We are still gathering cards for her on the welcome table behind the sanctuary, but if you would like to visit her or otherwise be in contact, please let me know, and I'd be happy to help share with you how to do that. Joyce S., another one of our very longtime members, has had surgery and is now in recovery at a local rehab center. She would love to have cards and calls from some of you um, I think I want to say that she is well into her 90s at this point, though you'd never guess it. And uh, I know that she is a little bit crabby and bored and somewhat lonely. <laughs> so while she has family, her daughter uh, Sue is helping her out. Um, some cards and messages of support would not go amiss. Mimi S., Joyce H.'s sister-in-law, is also in a rehab space. Uh, the same place as Joyce, in fact, and is working on the process of recovery after her car accident. So, a few hopeful things, and here are the joyful ones. Lucas Smith-Horn and Lindsay, his uh, fiancée Lindsay, 
were married yesterday. And Linda S. and Ed T.'s daughter, Catherine, was married to her beloved Patrick G. earlier this month as well. We wish these children of our congregation and their families all of the best as they begin their lives together. Please join me now in a time of prayer and meditation. The sources of our faith include so many things, including Jewish teachings. And the community of our faith includes our members and friends and family who are of Jewish background. And so we note that we are entering the days of awe. We are beginning the Jewish New Year. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are just here with us. This is the beginning of the new year, a fresh start, full of potential. And in this moment, we have the option of beginning in the ways we wish to continue, setting aside old ways, seeking forgiveness for our failings, acting to restore relationships that may be broken. The start of our congregational year is a time to examine how we will move forward together, how we serve what we know to be sacred, how we will open ourselves to the gifts that this new cycle brings. In this year, may we offer forgiveness to those who have wronged us and find it offered to us as well. May we offer compassion and mercy to those who have suffered and find it offered to us as well. May we offer blessings of wisdom and sweetness, love and joy, and find them offered to us as well. Let us take a time together in stillness for the prayers of our hearts and souls. In this new year, may we offer forgiveness, compassion, mercy, wisdom, sweetness, love, and joy, and find all of these things offered to us as well. Shana Tova, may this be a good year. Amen. Blessed be.
Our first reading is adapted from chapters 1 and 2 of the wisdom text, Pirkei Avot, in the Mishnah, the first compilation of Jewish oral law. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Make your study of the Torah a regular part of your life. Speak little, but do much. Receive all people with cheerfulness. Do not separate yourself from the community. Don't be satisfied with yourself until the day you die. Do not judge another person until you have stood in that person's place. Do not say something you shouldn't say just because you think no one is listening. Someone is always listening. Do not say, when I have free time, I'll study and learn. What if you never have free time? You don't have to finish the work, but you're not free to give up and not do it. Our second reading is adapted from Guiding Principles for Our Free Faith by James Luther Adams. The community of justice and love is not an ethereal fellowship that is above the conflicts and turmoils of the world. It is one that takes shape in the world, in nature and history. Freedom, justice, and love require a body as well as a spirit. We do not live by spirit alone. Anything that exists effectively in history must have form, and the creating of form requires power. Not only the power of thought, but also the power of organization and the organization of power. Thus, we deny the immaculate conception of virtue and affirm the necessity of community. The faith of a church is an adequate faith only when it inspires and enables people to give up their time and energy to shape the various institutions, social, economic, and political, of the common life. It is amazing how things creep up on us without us even noticing. Just like that slow-moving river that changes course over time, bringing the water right up against our porches or our toes, even before we know it's there. And then, suddenly, it's time to do something about it. Perhaps the stones lining the walkway in the memorial garden are just ready to fall over into the path. If you've walked through our memorial garden, you know that's actually true. They're leaning pretty solidly inward, and we're going to be starting to get that fixed just this week, by the way. But if I think about the story, too, perhaps we are living in a situation where the porch has been torn off of our house, really or metaphorically. Perhaps 
The things and structures that we thought were stable turn out to be more shaky than we thought. And I think many of us are discovering that that is true about aspects of our civil life, our economy, our democracy. We're seeing all these ways in which the things that we thought were just kind of what was and what will be are not necessarily guaranteed to be so. And in those moments, if we're wise, we gather together in service to one another and to our community. In these moments, this is when we choose to build or shore up or perhaps retreat such that we can come back to the river once again. I think about our prior few years, of course, right? There's been the pandemic, and I know that staff and leadership and many of you have come back to this church year, wanting this church year to be like all of that nonsense never happened. Like everything is just going to be exactly as it started out in 2019 when we had our last normal church year beginning where everything was well prepared and everything was settled and we knew exactly what everything looked like. And we've gone back to school. We're starting this fall, this new year, with the hope that everything is as it should be. And perhaps you've noticed this too. As much as I want that to be the case, I've noticed that that's not exactly always the case everywhere. Out in the world, and even among us, there is anxiety and desire and impatience and exhaustion and determination and also some stamina that isn't quite as strong as it had been before the world changed. What I have heard from you all, what I've seen, in the abominable driving of the past few weeks. Perhaps you have noticed this too. What I have heard and seen tells me that we have reached a point as a people and perhaps as a congregation too, where it is time for some of us to build and some of us to shore things up and it is time for some of us to retreat. And so when I say this, I mean that it's time to build by volunteering, stepping up to the community's needs and getting involved in the work at hand, taking on a big needed responsibility because you have the capacity for it, the desire, the joy. What's inside of you needs to be expressed in a way that tightens your bonds to the community and expands expresses the way in which this community can be fully present for everyone who comes. And for some of us, it is time to shore things up, to talk with one another, to have conversations about what's needed, what's not quite going right, what's going really well, giving responsible feedback, letting people know what pieces of life are a little broken and which ones are sturdy, and then stepping in to help build up some stones along that riverbank. Find the little tasks that are necessary. Perhaps this is your day to carry a spoon that's been misplaced and needs to go back to the kitchen. Or perhaps it is time for you to retreat. You might be somebody who has done so much and carried so much through these last three years that you realize that you need to set something down and give somebody else the possibility of helping out a little bit more. Perhaps this is your time to serve your community, this congregation, by stepping back from that river's edge to renew your spirit, your energy, your courage, so that when someone else needs to rest in six months or a year, you have what you need to jump in and help pick up those responsibilities again. 
as we enter this new year, it is time for us, me and the staff and all of you, to gather together in service to one another, to this community. James Luther Adams, our most prominent recent Unitarian theologian of the last century, writes, The community of justice and love is not an ethereal fellowship that is above the conflicts and turmoils of the world. The community of justice and love takes shape in the world, in nature, as part of history. Freedom, justice, and love require bodies as well as spirits. We don't live as spirit alone. I mean, that's really true, right? You all are sitting here in body as well as in spirit. Maybe there are a few of us that we can't see who have been haunting this church for a while, who are here in spirit alone, and I hope you're listening and do us some good too. But for us, we are here in bodies as well as spirits, whether in the building or at home. Adams writes that the virtues that we hold dear, freedom and justice and love, by their very nature require us to live them out in physical form, in these bodies that we inhabit rather than only admiring them deep within ourselves. For if we only admire them deep within and they don't make it outside, they're hardly real. In fact, I don't see any line between the spiritual and the material. They are totally intertwined. What we experience in our bodies, in the world, informs our spirits and our spiritual lives. And what we discover in that meditation, in that practice, in that reflection on our spirits, that determines how we live beyond ourselves. And so if religion seeks to strengthen our connections to that which is larger than ourselves, then it also asks us to attend to the things and the people to which we are connected. Our religion, our Unitarian Universalism, asks us to act and work in the world. And what that means is that sometimes we need to know when we have to let someone else set something down and we have to pick it up or when we need to set something down and let someone else pick it up instead. And so as this new year begins, both Rosh Hashanah and our church year, the wisdom of Pirkei Avot is incredibly powerful. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am not only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Make your study a regular part of your life. Speak little, do much, receive all people with cheerfulness. Do not separate yourself from the community. Do not be satisfied with yourself until the day you die. Do not judge another person until you have been in their place. Do not say something you shouldn't say just because you think no one is listening. Someone is always listening. And do not say, when I have free time, then I will study and learn. What if you never have or make free time? And the one that I love the most, you don't have to finish the work but you are not free to give up and not do it. So often we think that resting is giving up. Or maybe that it's a reward for having done enough. 
Maybe we think that doing no matter what is the only option, or that we have to do the same thing we've always done. I want some of you to hear me because I need to hear this too. I am one of you. Sometimes the exact right thing is to do less or to do something different. In a moment like this, it is time to reflect on whether it is time for you to build or shore up or retreat. To take the lead when somebody else must step back. To take on some tasks when you're able or help make things better when they're not quite right. To catch your breath when you have been doing a lot. Judaism reminds us in this time, with these words, that a religious life lives in the material and the spiritual, in the whole of existence. And that if we open ourselves to what is beyond us, if we remain open to the interdependent web of all existence, to all of the communities in which we are embedded, that we then will communicate with others. Renew ourselves, as well as do and make and create. James Luther Adams continues, The faith of a church is an adequate faith only when it inspires and enables people to give of their time and energy to shape the various institutions social, economic, and political, of the common life. Hear this again in other words. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? You don't have to finish the work but you are not free to give up and not do it. So as this new year begins, I want you to take a moment and think, what sort of service, whether here or beyond this place, is calling to you now? What commitment is waiting for you? Or speaking to you from deep within your heart and your soul? To what are you inspired to give your time and energy? Are you a spoon and pillow carrier? Are you able to pick up a chair or help carry a table across the village? Might you actually be a porch builder without really knowing it just yet? Are you drawn to the service of volunteering? This is the type of service that I suspect you hear about most often. It's the kind that we rely on to keep our congregations alive and moving. It is, as James Luther Adams says, the power of organization and the organization of power. But put more simply, it's what allows us to have coffee hour and religious education classes, music at worship, leadership on the board, Volunteers are, truthfully, what allow this congregation to exist at all. We need people to organize our groundskeepers and maintenance folks, also known as we do, in fact, need a new chair of our building and grounds committee right now. We do need people to organize those of you who would like to provide hospitality for our fellowship hour. We need teachers and advisors for our religious education. And we need those of you with special skills to be willing to help when those skills are exactly what we need. And we need those of you who are willing to try and learn and explore something new. So, of course, I am asking you to volunteer. This should be no surprise after what you've been hearing. But I want you to find where you want to serve. 
I want you to consider volunteering beyond where you think you might otherwise need to be. Perhaps you are an accountant, and you're used to people asking you to do things with numbers. I would invite you to consider trying something else. Maybe organizing our library would be the thing that would give you a break from your everyday life and feel satisfying. Or maybe helping with the garden. Maybe being an usher or a singer. Let me give you another example. To do the work of the Ministry of Religious Education, we need advisors for our junior high and high school youth because we want them to be fully part of this community. And that means getting to know some of you as well as knowing me and Patricia and Claire, our staff. I want our children and youth to know people who are not only their parents, to see other adults, to see how we all exist a little differently from one another and that that is good and right and worthwhile. The Ministry of Religious Education needs commitments in the short term and the long term, the equivalent of carrying a spoon and organizing a rebuilding of a porch. It needs commitments made with the understanding that we are joining into a ministry together when we agree to shape the hearts and minds and spirits of those we serve by teaching. We minister to one another in our classes, in our groups. So yes, the staff does that, but you all do that too. In the book group, in the short story discussion, in the men's group, and in the women's group, as part of our social justice and green sanctuary ministries, in the classes certainly that I teach and you participate in, by sharing with one another, we minister to one another. We open our spirits and our hearts. We become more than we were not long before. So when there's a chance to sign up for small group ministry or any other classes that come up, that, too, is not only something for yourself, but it is a volunteerism. It is a way to serve one another. Another example. We need the service of gracious conversation, responsible feedback, of caring for one another's time and hearts, as well as our programmatic needs. We need to help one another shore up where things aren't quite right yet, I need people to come forward and talk to the leadership and say in healthy and wonderful ways, this program was fantastic, or did you consider maybe doing this? It would have expanded the reach. It might have been more inclusive. Or I noticed that we didn't have enough people to make this happen. Next time, let me know. I'm happy to help. We are going to be looking at our ministry in this congregation in the spring and talking about how we do that work. You all, how you do it, how I do it, how the board does it, we're going to explore all of that together. See how we are making progress toward meeting our vision. Wondering where we're at now that the pandemic has ended. And I'm actually really excited about this because that kind of information helps me to know and helps us all to know how we can do what we do the best way possible. And that might not sound terribly spiritual, but it is. Because the process of giving loving assessment requires compassion. It requires empathy. It requires us to look at one another and say, I'm guessing that we're all doing the very best we can, and within that, here's something else that we need to know. By leaning into our deep love, rather than our anxiety or our impatience, we are better able to make this place and the world at large a better place than it is right now. And, we must remember and honor the service of self-care, of retreat, 
recognizing when we are overburdened or burnt out or just out of step with everything else. In those moments, it's good to step forward to somebody and say, I think I need a break. I feel like I've been carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders, and it's time to set something down and let somebody else pick this up for a bit, too. Sabbath. Intentional rest is not the same as giving up. It is part of staying engaged. You don't have to finish the work, but you are not free to give it up and not do it. The lessons of Sabbath are part of Jewish life and should be part of all our lives, because without rest we cannot thrive and return to the work. So if this is your year in which, or maybe month in which, to retreat, maybe this is your year to contribute financially more than with time, or to contribute more with leadership than with teaching, perhaps this is your time to plant some things and pull some weeds. And perhaps it's all you can do just to come to worship. Perhaps it is all you can do to sit at home and turn on the computer and attend worship. Perhaps this is the year in which you need to spend time nurturing yourself, to feed your soul rather than offer up the fruits of your labor. And if that's the case, that is a good and right thing to do. Every one of us is going to come to a moment where it's more important to take a class than to teach one, or to sit in worship rather than lead a committee. Even if you are doing the work, you will have moments when you must be meditating, or praying, or singing, or simply sitting in quiet and peace. After years like the years we've had, renewing our interior lives are as important a service as any other. That's, in fact, what allows us to come back to volunteer or take on a task without feeling drained and tired. And that kind of attention, that kind of reflection, will remind us when it is the right moment to build or shore up once again. And so it's my hope that you will find a balance of these three. Building, shoring up, retreating, volunteering, conversation, self-care, both here and beyond this place. And then in that balance, you can grow in connection to the all that is, to your innermost self, to one another. You can then join in joyful service to this community and the other communities to which you are responsible. It is through serving together that we strengthen this congregation and our individual abilities to live out this faith in the world for ourselves, but also for everyone else who needs what we have to share. And so in this time, I invite you to pray for whoever that siren is for, and also to figure out what it is that you should be doing in this very moment and know that in that way you offer your service to what is most important. May it be so. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 400 in the Gray Hymnal. Number 400, Shalom Havairim. It is in Hebrew, but written phonetically, so you will be just fine. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together.
Please join me in speaking our unison benediction. It is in your order of worship. Engage with the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings. Please be seated for our postman. Please do join us in Fisk Hall for our voter uh, rally, um, as well as refreshments and time of fellowship. It's straight to the back of the building. Follow anybody with a Universalist Church name tag. <laughs> 